Good afternoon. This is Dr. John Bennett broadcasting from sunny Miami. Today in Larkin Hospital TV and the Neurosurgical Channel, we once again have Richard Mendel, MD, a spinal surgeon from St. Petersburg, Florida, who's going to talk about stem cells today. And we're also joined by two distinguished foreign panelists. And Frederick, welcome back to the fold. Hi, guys. Live from Belgium here. Uh, it's been a while, but I'm ready for another great hangout. <laughs> Well, Thanks, good, good to have you back, Frederick. And uh, my main man, Simon, in Japan. Hi, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to this. I'm a medical student in Tokyo. Thank you so Very much. Good. Well, welcome, Simon. Okay, Richard, it's all yours. Okay. Um, what we'll do today is just kind of start a multi-series, um, uh, multiple episode series on stem cells. And it's not going to be directly applicable to neurosurgery per se. We're going to just talk about w where the science is now and I'm going to try to give you a brief introduction but enough background to understand what what is worth talking about and what is you know not not really valid at all. Um, so the brief introduction what we're going to talk about over the next few weeks is the science and the medicine of, of stem cells and the reasonable expectations over the next few years on where things are going and what is possible now and what is just complete science fiction. Um, so hopefully you walk away with this with some of the fundamental knowledge that has come out of the research that's really been going on since about 1981 uh, when the first stem cell first notion of stem cells uh, in mice uh, and, and and the development of knockout mice occurred in and that was 1981 and um, that work plus some of the um, manners in which to isolate and manipulate stem cells got um, the research from 81 uh, as well as uh, researchers from the University of Utah and the University of Wisconsin uh, Nobel Prizes in 2007. So we'll kind of go over what's been done so far, but we're not going to talk about ethics. We're not going to talk about laws or politics. There's many good publications on that, and I'm, I'm not even going to touch on it. I'm, we're just going to talk about the, the science and the you know give you a working knowledge so that when you when you look through a paper you you understand things uh, enough to know what is valid and what's not valid so to start out there's two criteria for a stem cell okay it's got to be able to rep reproduce itself and it's got to be able to generate the offspring of different functional cell types. Um, the notion is that the stem cell is like this omnipotent, uh, universally uh, applicable cell that can generate almost every cell in the body. And that is somewhat of a myth right now. Okay, So we'll, we'll get to that in a few minutes, but you have to think of the cellular, the cell as a structural unit. So, you know, when when I was taking biology just as a high school student, they would you would often hear about the nucleus being the brain of the cell. And when you think about it, you know, it, in some ways it made sense, but the nucleus really just contains all the the, the genetic material, the DNA as well as um, you know genetic components and genes that dictate what what the rest of the cell is going to do so the cytoplasm is where your proteins and all sorts of molecules are that do the mechanical and biomechanical tasks so when you think about gene expression that describes the production of proteins from the active genes right and we often, e even doctors and scientists will refer to genes as genes, and you think, well, 
a gene will just produce X or Y. And you have to remember that the gene has variants. And the variants of those genes are the alleles. So we really should be referring to uh, a tip, a, a gene uh, as its allele type, not really as its, quote, gene type. And so the genome itself is, of course, the set of all genes present in the cell nucleus, even though the differentiated cells are, are going to have a tremendous amount of these genes completely turned off. Okay, so now th this, this is where things start to get kind of complicated. Um, we talk about cells as the, the structural unit of animals and plants, but basically you can break up cell, cell lines in your thinking into two categories, undifferentiated and differentiated. Okay, and if you look at the last statement, it says stem cells can only be defined by their behavior. So a cell really is only defined by what proteins it produces. And so when you look at a, an undifferentiated cell, when you look at it, may be a kind of bland not not interesting looking cell under the microscope. And you may very well think it's undifferentiated, but you won't know that until you know what the what that what that cell with its genes are set to produce. So until you can look at its production, you don't really know if it's diff if it's an undifferentiated cell or not, because as you're going to see, there are many, many cells that appear undifferentiated but have some specialization or differentiation that only gets recognized by things like we talked about weeks ago, which is the uh, CRISPR-Cas9, okay? Um, so if you think about a couple weeks ago, do, do you remember when we talked about... Um, Neuronal. You don't really know if it's a different, if it's an undifferentiated cell or not. This is actually yeah. Yeah. neural differentiation. Oh, I'm sorry, there's an echo. Okay. Have some specialization or differentiation. Yeah, I'm not no sure what's going on. Oh, yeah, that was better. It stopped now. Can you hear me? Yeah, that's from me, Richard. I'll turn myself off here. I'll move. Oh, oh, okay. That's all right. So anyway. You're not going to know really whether something's differentiated or undifferentiated just by appearance. Okay. Now, when you think about um, differentiated cells, usually um, they're going to have a typical uh, characteristic. Like every it seems like every medical student you ever meet, every doctor you ever meet, after they've taken pathology no matter how brain dead they become, the minute you flash up a hepatocyte, um, they recognize it. Like, I don't know what it is. And, and neurons are pretty easy to recognize. These are examples of differentiated cell lines, hepatocytes, cardiomyocytes, neurons. But when you get back, these are clear structure, clearly structurally different than than uh, undifferentiated cells, but because it's the protein that the gene produces that defines the type of cell it is, it just may not be all that interesting looking. It may not look like a neuron, but it may be what's called a progenitor cell to, to an, a, a neural uh, cell type or a cardiac cell type or a hepatocyte. Those are all kind of interesting looking structures. So let's get back, the, I'm going to skip back here and s reinforce this. The archetypical cell, stem cell is the embryonic stem cell and it's a mythical human created artifact rather than an entity that we can really define in nature. 
it's kind of like Zeno's paradox, where you know you shoot the arrow at the target or the bullet at the target, and if you take an infinite number of photographs, you can kind of make the argument that there's just never one one moment when it actually permeates the target. You know, so um, this is um, from Aristotle, the syllogism, right? So syllogism is where you have this major premise and a minor premise. So you say under, undifferentiated cells may appear generic under the microscope, but it's the protein that, that its active genes produce. Therefore, you know, an undifferentiated cell, they're, they're, they, most undifferentiated cells are especially in some way, often in a way that restricts it from being another type of cell. Okay, so we, we say that all stem cells are of an undifferentiated type, but not all undifferentiated cells um, are stem cells. Does that make sense? Stem cells are undifferentiated cells, but not all undifferentiated cells are, are stem cells. That, that becomes important later on because, you know, there's many, cell, there's many criteria of what a, um, a stem cell actually is. So you, you, they need to meet those two criteria that we talked about. It has to be able to reproduce itself and also reproduce other, other types of cells in the organism that it belongs to. So let's get back to, um, I want to go to renewable tissues. Okay. All right, so now we're going to talk about um, renewable tissue. And a good example of renewable tissue is, is your skin or your intestinal lining or hemo poietic cells in the blood, all right? But for this purpose, we'll just talk about skin cells. So, you know, we, we, have, we have an epidermis that's essentially, you know, comes from keratinocytes, and, you know, once the cells die on the, bait, on the epidermis, they just slough off. But we're constantly producing new cells. And... You know, the skin reproduces itself incredibly fast. So does the hemopoietic system or the uh, GI system. So um, with the skin, you have this outer layer of the epidermis. It has these kerat keratinocytes, and they're constantly being worn away. But they're constantly also being reproduced in the basal layer. So what happens is we have a basal layer that contains a type of stem cell that can't produce every type of cell, but it can produce every type of cell uh, that's going to be uh, part of the uh, epidermis. So 50% of those cells in the basal layer will remain there uh, to amplify the production of m more uh, uh, more uh, cells that would eventually um, travel through the entire skin layers to the epidermis, and as it travels, it will it will change the activity of the genes in it and change the output of the uh, of the active genes to, to produce more and more uh, keratin as it gets closer and closer to the surface. So this is kind of a diagram of a renewable tissue. This is the stem cell, and in a way, it, it, it's probably not the idyllic uh, embryonic stem cell that can perform an uh, that can produce neurons, cardiomyocytes, hepatocytes, but it, it very well may be able to produce, it, it can produce every, every layer, say, of the skin or the dermis. So there's a basal layer that contains stem cells, and then it has what are called, instead of progenitor cells, it's called 
tissue amplifying cells that really just step up the production of all these differentiated cells that end up on your skin or in your GI tract or um, or in your bloodstream. So these are what you call tish, tissue specific stem cells. But you notice that there is a component of this this cell that's really not like the embryonic stem cell. It, it can produce its own specific tissue but no others. So right there you, you've introduced a degree of specialization. Um, let's see. So as uh, you know that I've already mentioned that the degree of specialization. So now as I mentioned the, the most famous cell of all is that embryonic stem cell and really they don't exist in nature right now. Um, we, we have isolated what are likely to be em likely to meet our criteria of what an embryonic stem cell is but they're not in vivo, they're in vitro which is Latin for in glass, you know they're, they are uh, cells that are um, manipulated and put in a growth medium so that they retain their pluripotency, their ability to develop into other types of cells um, for, for a short period of time. But they don't stay as embryonic stem cells for long. So um, um, they, the idea is that they kind of become a stem cell in, in, and the way in which they're limited is that they can't produce tissues other outside of their own type but for that they're good at producing these progenitor cells which provide a, a renewable source so you have to be cognizant here of whether when you're reading about something whether it's an in vitro meaning in glass cell culture or whether it's the notion of a pluripotent stem cell that can divide into all kinds of tissue types. Now recently that 2007 Nobel Prize from U the professors at Utah and Wisconsin was really granted on the ability of them to induce a pluripotent stem cell that could divide into other tissue types. But that's really quite far away right now. This, this is what, what the problems in stem cell therapy are right now. Um, virtually every important cell type in the body does not grow during adult life. Okay, so when you think about the cells in, of an adult human, there, there's an estimate that there's about 210 different types of cells in humans. But I don't really know how accurate that is because if you remember weeks and weeks ago we talked about um, um, Camille Golgi and the staining of neurons and this, this was work done in Spain um, 200 years ago and at the time the, the thought was that there were five different types of cells in the retina of the eye but I told you in that talk that it turns out and that's what I was taught in 1989 when I graduated from medical school there's actually 65 different types of cells in the retina of the eye so I don't know whether the 200 10 takes those 65 into account or not but you know that was all from um, um, the work of um, uh, Cajal, Raymond Cajal, Santiago Raymond Cajal and um, Golgi 200 years back so there may be quite a bit more in the way of the number of cells in the in our body the number of types because as I said we're not recognizing 
what to all outward appearances look like undifferentiated cells. Um, so the really useful types of cells that we need, like hepatocytes for the liver or the beta cell, the islet cells of Langerhans and the pancreas, those, you know, they don't divide in tissue cultures. If they, you know, divided, they would lose their functionability pretty quickly. So today, most of the current therapy that goes on has nothing to do with amplification of, of cells. And, um, you know, what, what we do is almost all blood-based, hemopoetically based, um, in that we graft cells from one person to another. And, you know, the significant application of that is things like bone marrow transplants, that's the most important kind of current stem cell therapy. We're not able to up and down regulate, amplify different tissues. And so here, here are the remaining di difficulties, okay? The first difficulty is finding a stem cell that you can, that has a renewable source and you can make enough cells to reproduce the function of an organ. Um, but the other problem is immunity. And this is a two-edged two sword. With immunity, you know, the, our T cells are really efficacious, T cell lymphocytes of knowing what are, quote, not self cells. And so the immune system is great as at finding cells that aren't intrinsic, that, that are foreign to us, and killing them. And that's done with cytokines, and interferons are just a type of cytokine. And you know interferons from all the um, oncologic applications. And then there's also the HLA system, which is the human leukocyte antigens. And those are the glycoproteins that are on you know, on blood cells, and and it has a myriad diversity of permutations, really, and so you really would need to very fine tune the immune system um, or get perfect matches for people, and you know that's not realistic. And the last, the last issue in in immunity is the nightmare of immunosuppressive drugs for people that were getting transplants. You know people that even get a common transplant like a kidney, I mean they're really uh, impaired by the amount of immunosuppressive drugs that they have to take. So remember now the, the, so, the difficulty so far. The first heading is a source or a renewable um, source of cells that can be exploited. Number two is that you have to impair the immune system or outregulate it. And number three is delivery of drugs. Okay, the delivery system of, of, a, um, of a particular thing that you want to graft uh, is not well thought out yet. So if you think back to the 1980s, even the early 90s, you heard about a group of neurosurgeons in Mexico that were implanting um, cells into the uh, substantia nigra and the basal ganglia of Parkinson's patients trying to improve their function. And, you know, that's not uh, that's fraught with all kinds of difficulties and we're only now getting to get a really good grip on the immune system itself, let alone neuroimmunology. So the holy grail for, trans for stem cell transplantation is really going to be producing a cell tissue or organ that doesn't need immunosuppression. And that is the lead into what we're going to talk about next time, which is personalized pluripotent stem cells. Because taking uh, an individual 
uh, genetic makeup and looking at their alleles, not 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 um, just generalized gene production, but the alleles that they have, and trying to taper something for them in the future. Now, having said all that, the last slide is kind of important. It's also kind of sad. You know, we have what what goes on now in medicine is aspirational stem cell therapy, and a lot of bench scientists just talk about stem cell tourism because there's a, a lot of money involved in this. If you remember a very, very well-known quarterback in Indianapolis went outside the country to have stem cell therapy to fix the cervical disc he had herniated in his neck. Now, he went to, apparently went to France and uh, he had blood drawn out of an IV line and then re-injected, um, I don't know if it was the same day or later in the day, and then had his anterior cervical discectomy done. And unfortunately that failed to fuse, which is a very common problem with the operation, an anterior cervical discectomy. But certainly the withdrawal of blood from... A, from his vein and reinjection later later that day or at the same time really was wishful or magical. This quarterback could have gone to one of the best spine surgeons in the country that lives right in Indianapolis, but somehow, you know, because of uh, people he trusted, uh, you know, he went to some place that promised the sizzle of stem cell therapy or stem cell tourism. So when you watch commercials on TV and you see a Neutrogena product talking about messenger RNA and revitalizing skin, I mean, it, it's kind of absolutely ridiculous. The, the keratin in the top layer of skin is dead anyway, so you're not bringing that back to life. Uh, and so media and commercials are really ridiculous when you understand where we are in terms of stem cell therapy now. So I hope that gives you just a general introduction. What you know right now is stem, a stem cell has to be able to reproduce itself and has to be able to generate numerous of all the progenitor cells in its particular type of tissue. But the the iconic embryonic stem cell, we've never seen it in nature. We talk about it and we put it in vitro, in glass, and we make, manipulate something that, to the point where it can diverge in a huge um, algorithm to all kinds of different cells, but that's not uh, something that's been discovered in nature yet. It's just an idea we have. So, are there any questions right now? I mean, I, I think it'll, it's going to come together a lot more as we start talking about specific topics. But you have to take these aspirational stem cell therapy and the stem cell tourism nonsense with a grain of salt because there's a lot of money involved and there's very little science. Uh, and... You know, unfortunately, a lot of medicine, uh, you know, double-blinded controlled, stu controlled studies weren't even invented to the 1940s, so you can, you can fool yourself into thinking you're doing something that yields great results, but, you know, um, it, it, there's, there's not a scientific basis for it. So you have to be pretty stringent about how you're going to talk about the stem cells as we we proceed, but you understand now we're not going to talk about he has this gene or that gene. We're going to talk about the alleles of the gene uh, rather than, um, you know, just because somebody has an impaired gene doesn't mean it's going to be a problem. You know, we know that um, with certain types of dementia, the, the uh, haplotypes and the t different types of genes or, or the alleles that they have have a high predictability for things like Alzheimer's disease and dementias. So. 
Well, you know, Richard, uh, thank you very much for a very clear presentation with great slides. And uh, this is one area, as you know, that needs education, like you mentioned at the end, uh, because there's just too many people being defrauded, going overseas, believing the hype. And we really need people like you educating uh, other people about what's really going on. Uh, and we hope to use Hangouts to, have, to try to help to educate people. One, one question, Richard. Now, the, um, when they say you talk about embryonic cell, stem cells, are those stem cells that are in the placenta? Because I've heard a lot about controversy about placenta stem cells, and, and there's a lot of controversy about you know, those kind of things. Well, yeah, that, that's a great question. And, you know, I think the people... Um, I think in Britain they do a lot, lot better job with the vocabulary they use. See, uh, here we, we talk about embryos, and, and you're right. I mean, that, that's what we're talking about. With, with human stem cells, um, the, um, it's better to, to think of what the embryo is because the embryo that we talk about is really better called a conceptus because once the sperm and egg come together not only does it generate the portions of the body on the baby but it also generates a portion of the placenta so both the mother generates a portion of the placenta and so does the conceptus or what we call the embryo mm -hmm. what, we, what we're really talking about is that an embryo and a piece of placenta, that's the conceptus that comes out of the union of the sperm and the egg. Mm -hmm. So, okay. you know, probably the right, the right way to talk about it is to say it's a conceptus, but we kind of all talk, use the word embryo now. It's kind of, it, it's, a, it's not really right, but that's what we talk about. So, yeah, the, the, the portions of the placenta that are maternal versus embryonic do fall into a gray zone but and it's important to know that but I'm not going to talk about like I told you the ethics laws or anything I'm just going to mention the science of it and the science okay. is that when the sperm and egg come together and they form that trophoblast which is the layer around the thing we call an embryo that embryo also gets um, that also that embryo also generates a portion of the placenta. So that's why uh, uh, that's why it's probably right to call it a conceptus. But n but nobody else does except the people in Britain are just more exact, wh which is good. It's clear. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Simon, do you have a question? Oh yes, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Mandel. I always love to listen to your, your basic uh, science discussions, and I'm fascinated. I just um, finished a hematology, oncology, immunology block six weeks, and I took a 100-question exam a couple of days ago. But, you know, looking at your presentation, I realized they still have a lot of questions, and there are things I was not recognizing. And when I talk to uh, working physicians and I talk to them about what I'm studying, they say, boy, I don't remember any of that. And I say, yeah. you're kidding. Yeah. <laughs> I said, well, well, it's so important. Yeah, Need well, to, yeah. It's, it's important really to the basic scientists, right? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, if you're a clinician, you, you're worried about the patient. And so mm -hmm. you, you get these different, you get these different, and th this is very important culturally, right? If you're a basic scientist and you do something like inject some bone marrow into a kidney and the function of the kidney improves 2%. Mm -hmm. and you're, but you know that every one of those bone marrow cells is dead an hour later. You say, well, we don't need to look at that any further. But the clinician says, hey, that patient was two, got 2% 2 better. I don't care what the science is. As long as they got better, I'm happy. And, mm -hmm. and, and it's... You know that's an extreme view. You know something. You know I just made up, but it's not. Yeah. It's not. It's not the right view on either side. And you know I think the the thing that's really happened over the last twenty years that's making things much more interesting 
is that two different groups of people are coming together. You have biological scientists or doctors and basic researchers, right? Mm -hmm. And when they have, when they take something from life in vivo, in nature, and put it in glass, in vitro, right? The biologic scientist thinks of that as a artifact, and mm -hmm. it's a negative thing because what they want to do is understand nature. They don't want to understand. They don't want to look at contaminated speech, yeah. contaminated instances of nature. They want to look at actual natural processes, right? Mm -hmm. But the bioengineer who are getting more and more involved they now want to look at ways to make products, useful products for people, right? So they look at that artifact like a giant plus because they've taken, you've taken something from nature in vivo, in vivo, and now it's put in glass in vitro, and, and the cell adapts some way or it's manipulated some way and then the engineer says, well, you know, we can manipulate X, Y, and Z and produce something that's... So you're getting a new look at things by the engineer who just come from a different culture. And the scientists made it possible for these engineers to get in, into bioengineering. And the, that, was, that was a book by Carlson called... Biology is technology. It's about ten years old now, but you know it, it heralded the engineers uh, and people to start manipulating biologic mm -hmm. systems rather than mechanical systems. So you know, you're right. Like you, you're the hematologist you work with, they n may know an infinite am amount about the cells that they can manipulate. But the things that they can't manipulate or that just don't, that haven't presented themselves yet mm. aren't as important to them. That's, that's and, what I, I'm, and, yeah, I'm sorry. No, yeah, they aren't as important to them. Yeah, and that's the point, yeah. You're exactly right, but you have to remember that over the last two or three years, mm. the whole world has changed in immunology. Yeah. Now we're better and manipulating the immune system and that ability has actually become like another tool for oncologists. They have, you know, Do you think there's a Higgs, a Higgs boson of That's medicine on the horizon? Uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I'm certainly hmm. not going to live long enough to see it, but yeah, there's probably an infin infinite direction down and an infinite Direction exactly. up, you know. We've, and, ex we've observed, yeah. we haven't explained. And I yeah, would like to see more explain there's, explanations. And the good, now we're in an interesting point because we're at a point now where we're observing things and we're not even able to see that they're, they're specialized. You have to actually see what they produce to know that they're mm -hmm. specialized. So, yeah, it's very interesting now. Because we're just going into, I mean, these worlds were unimaginable, a hot, you know, 200 years ago. Yeah, um, it, yeah it's, it's a whole other world now. It, it's getting really interesting. Yeah, we yeah we hope to go to these places with hangouts. Yeah. But Richard, I'd like to, uh, I don't know if you met uh, Bernardo de Andrada, from, a spinal neurosurgeon from Rio. Have oh. you met Bernardo? Oh. Hello, Bernardo. Oh. Welcome, Bernardo. I can't hear you, Bernardo. I think you're muted. Oh, that's great. Oh, hello, Bernardo. <laughs> oh no. Oh, what? Oh. Well, anyways, anyways, uh, anyways, Bernardo. Uh, I, I think he's come to some of your hangouts before, but uh, yeah, it's just a fascinating area, and we can go in many places. And I guess you're going to have a few more hangouts about stem cells, right, Richard? Yeah, I mean, it's probably going to be four or five of them, I think, oh, good. to well, cover it. Because well, yeah, and like I say, this is one area of medicine that really needs education. Well, we're really, gonna yeah, we're going to come back to a loop, because if you see the CRISPR, the CRISPR-Cas9 system, 
was the way to retrace genetics because you could just you could use these palindromic sequences and it would tell you what the gene made and then that that way you could characterize the gene and also that reflects back on when we talked about the brain's identity crisis that article that appeared in science a while ago so yeah it's we're going to back we're going to be able to backtrack and really date things a lot better in nature that have come before well you know you, you just hear of so many disastrous cases where people go to Latin countries and Korea and China thinking that uh, they'll cure arthritis or yeah well uh, for thirty thousand dollars forty thousand dollars fifty thousand uh, dollars it's a shame so many people yeah. are scammed in the stem yeah. cell area yeah well you know you have to <laughs> buy or beware if you don't understand the science it's probably not you know it's probably not real That's very good Okay, we'll end this broadcast, and uh, we'll just hang around, see if you can get to talk to Bernardo. Thank you, Richard. Uh, thank you, thank Simon. You.